So today I'm going to be talking about um, Swept Source OCT artifacts uh, and how you can remove them and image enhancement. Um, so obviously this is what an OCT angiography looks like. And we want to know how we can actually get to this type of image where we get a very, very clear uh, picture and we have no artifact. In order to do that, we need to have an understanding of what are the actual artifacts in, in OCT angiography. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is, on, on, uh, uh, to begin with, uh, what is Octara? What is the OCT angiography uh, mechanism that we're using in order to get the, uh, the uh, angiography? And then I'm going to be talking about what are the projection artifacts, what are the white band artifacts, what are the black band ar artifacts, uh, what is speckle noise and flicker noise, and then we're going to talk a little bit about OCT averaging and doing 3D visualization in order to get a better image. So in order to understand what projection artifacts are, first we have to understand what is OCT angiography. In order to do this, I took my right eye. This is my eye that I create a little animation of. And I want to show how do we get an OCT angiography of that vessel. So what we do is we take four scans of this, uh, 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 of this vessel and we put them together and we do a subtraction analysis or a movement contrast image. And we put those together and we get an OCT angiography of the movement inside the vessels. Now I've showed this uh, animation several times to several people. And uh, in Rome, in the, uh, in the OCT meeting in Rome, I looked out in the, uh, in the audience, there was 1,500 people there, and I realized that absolutely nobody understood how OCTA works because it's a difficult concept. Now, Rick had previously made uh, some, so, some animations to show how that works, and I took that idea and I wanted to repeat it to really uh, show how, uh, how the whole thing works. So I was in Rome, so I went to the Trevi Fountain in Rome uh, with my iPhone, and I took an image of it. And you can see all of the statues, you can see all of the moving water, and what I wanted to do was to create an OCT angiography of the Trevi Fountain. Now, how do you do that? You take this footage, you copy it, you remove one frame, and then you subtract one from the other. And that's how you get an OCT angiography. And this is what comes out. So this is an OCT angiography of the Trevi Fountain. You've got the larger vessels and you've got the smaller vessels. Now if you summate all of that, you can actually get exactly what we have in an OCT angiography. Okay, so now we know how OCT angiography works, but do we know how the artifacts work? Why do we get projection artifacts? We get pro uh, in order to show that, I went to the uh, Piazza di Navona in, in, in Italy at night. And here you have a light source over here. You've got your moving water, you've got the fountain, and you've got this lion's head. Now what we have is we can correlate this, or we can think about this, that this light source over here is the OCTA, uh, or the laser source. This is your vessel. The fountain is the RPE, and this is a fibrosis on the RPE. Now what happens is the light goes through the vessel, picks up the movement of the vessel. The problem is that all of the, the, the light goes through the entire uh, vessel and starts doing flickering artifacts on this line's head and on the, um, uh, on the fountain. Now when you, when you do a subtraction analysis of that, you can see the vessel very well, but you can also see the lion's head is flickering. And that's a projection artifact. Now when you sum that, you can see the vessel very clearly, but you can see also some, some strange kind of movement inside of, uh, uh, of the lion's head, and that is the projection artifact that we're looking for. Now, if that's a fibrosis, and you're just looking at a fibrosis, and you start seeing vessels in this fibrosis, you have to take a look at what kind of vessels are above it in order to see whether or not these vessels are actually real. So, what can we do to get rid of that? So if you have here the outer retinal layers of a choroidal neovascularization, you obviously see the choroidal neovascularization right there. But you also see the projection artifact of all of these superficial vessels. So what we can do is to subtract one from the other. You just subtract the superficial vessels from the outer retinal vessels, and then what is left 
is the, uh, uh, the real neovascularization. This is not a perfect solution because you also lose some of the information inside of the, the, the choroidal neovascularization. And obviously, everybody's working on getting this to work better, but it is possible to then really, really view what's going on. Another type of, uh, of, of artifact that you see inside of the OCT angiographies is the so-called white band artifact. And you can see these little white bands right up here going across the entire scan, and then you can see that they follow through all of the different layers and all the way down to the chori capillaris. That is due to movement during the actual al algorithm. So it gets picked up as movement because in between those, uh, those, uh, the, 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 the scans, the patient moved. Luckily, this is now very, very easily to remove using software in post-processing. So you can just have those removed and you immediately get uh, a lack of, uh, of these white band artifacts. Very different problem are the so-called black band artifacts because they are not based on movement. They are actually based on a segmentation failure. Because in complex choroidal neovascularizations, no computer is ever going to be 100% correct when it is doing the segmentation. In future, we might be able to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to do correct segmentation. But in the meantime, we are going to have the problem that in some areas, the segmentation fails and you suddenly get these thick black lines that, uh, that are uh, obscuring your image. This can also be solved with, uh, with, with a new software in the way that we just have an automatic way of doing a manual segmentation override where you can just repair these segmentations. Obviously, a scan, the modern scans have 512 single B scans, and you don't want to do this correction for every layer of 512 scans. So what uh, we are working on is to create a way of self-propagating all of the corrections that you're making, so you only make it once and it propagates through the entire scan. You also, in OCT, by the very, very nature of the way OCT works, you will have different kinds of noise. One is speckle noise. Speckle noise are these small little points that you see here that are all over in uh, the system. You also have horizontal flicker noise, which is changes in, in light intensity between the single lines. But these can be removed in post-processing. And when you remove them and when you segment it slightly differently, you get from this image to this image. These two are the same images. This and this is the same image. And what you can see is that when you do these kind of noise reduction algorithms and you do different segmentation, you have a lot more information coming out of the OCT than we, uh, than we originally thought. So there is so much more information in OCTA than, uh, than we were originally thinking uh, that we could see. Another possibility that, that uh, Vas was already talking about was averaging. Now, if you take the same image three or four times in exactly the same space, you can get from this type of image to this type of image. And this is very, very important because if you look at the foveal or avascular zone, you can see that here on the, uh, on the raw image, it's not continuous. It's got uh, areas where it's lacking the signal. But when you look at this image, you've got a continuous border across the entire foveal avascular zone. And that is absolutely very important if you're going to do measurements on the area of the foveal avascular zone. So doing an averaging can really significantly help. Also, in the deep plexus, you can see a lot more detail in the averaged area, and you can see where there are changes uh, uh, in, uh, in the deep vessels. The same thing is, of course, uh, uh, relevant also when you're doing vascular density maps, that if you have an averaged image like you have here, you see a lot more detail and a lot more quality than you did in the original image. Now, one of the things that I was working on, let me check my time here. One of the things that I was working on 
uh, in my uh, previous research was three-dimensional visualization of OCT data. Now, as you can see in this patient, this was a patient who came to my clinic. Uh, it was 8 o'clock at night on a Friday. And we had to decide, are we going to do surgery on this patient immediately, or is this something that can wait until the Monday? And when you look at it, you can see that the, uh, the, the retinal detachment is very, very close to the fovea, but we need to decide, is the fovea in immediate danger? And if you look at it, you can see that there are actual waves on the fovea, meaning there's imminent uh, danger that this fovea is going to become a macula off patient. So this was a patient that had to have the surgery immediately. Now, if you compare this to this patient, who also happened to come in uh, at 8 o'clock on Friday, you can see that you have some tractive lines on the macula. But if you look beneath the uh, a retinal detachment, you can already see where the macula is from the bottom. So that is obviously a macula off situation. Now you can obviously, in the, some of these cases, you can see these things on a simple B scan or even just by looking into the eye. But there are cases where the, uh, the changes are so subtle that you need these kinds of three-dimensional visualizations in order to see what's going on. Now previously I'd been working together with Alcon on the Jetreya project. And in order to try to find a way to increase the quality of the decision making on whether or not we can use uh, ocreplasmin to, 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 to release attraction, I was creating this type of visualization where you can see here the vitreomacular traction, but on the top you can actually see how thin the collagen fibers are that are connecting and, and pulling the, the, uh, uh, the retina up. So using this kind of technology, it is you have a much better way of judging whether or not ocreplasmin would be an effective way of treating the patient. And of course you can also look at this patient and in this patient you have a much thicker, much more solid uh, vitreomacular traction and a, vi uh, and a vitreopapillary traction. This is not somebody that we would use um, ocreplasmin on, also because this was a patient with posterior uveitis. But you can take the same patient and you have a lot more information. Let me look at my time. Uh, you have a lot more information than we originally thought. So you have the possibility of looking at the, the choroidal thickness going through the entire scan, which is very important in uveitis patients. But you have all of these inflammatory cells floating above uh, the retina. And what I was trying to then see, is it possible to use this kind of data set in swept source OCT angiography in order to visualize and to quantify the amount of inflammatory cells in posterior uveitis. And if you look at the data set, when we now fly through this bridge, you'll be able to see that it's possible to visualize every single inflammatory cell that's floating above the, uh, uh, above the retinal space. Theoretically, we could just take a sample of that and have an automatic count, and then we have an objective measure of inflammatory response inside uveitis, and that's due to, to, to swept source. So I took this technology that I had been working on, and I said, can we use this in order to visualize OCTA and get more information on OCT angiography? And this is what com uh, came out. So you have a patient. The patient has some SHREM, the patient has some subretinal fluid, and uh, in, the, uh, in the fundus image all you see is the, the, the fibrosis. Inside that fibrosis you have got this cauliflower shaped choroidal neovascularization. It's got the loops, it's got the halo, it's got all of the five criteria that Koskis came up with for an active CMV. Now the question is is it possible to take that information and look at it three-dimensionally and see if we can actually get more information and more criteria because these vascular loops are actually a three-dimensional structure and not a two-dimensional structure? So I created this th uh, way of visualizing three-dimensionally. Three now this isn't enough because this is a voxel representation, so we have to go and take it one step further and create a triangle mesh segmentation. And in the triangle mesh segmentation, 
I created a way of segmenting it so that you actually have a real segmentation, as you can see right here. Now, if you have a triangle mesh segmentation of a choroidal neovascularization, you can really start doing volumetric analysis and structural analysis in a different way. And in the future, this will give us the possibility to really evaluate on a quantitative level if there are any changes uh, in the uh, choroidal neovascularization over time. Thank you very much for your attention.